Hello and welcome. I'm Andrew Pettiprin, Fellow of Popular Culture at the Word on Fire Institute. I'm talking today to my colleague Matt Nelson, who is also Fellow of the Word on Fire Institute and apologist. Matt, how are you? Doing well. We're going to talk about something that you'll be talking about um, publicly, which is the rise and fall of atheism, which is a provocative topic. What, what's the rise of atheism? Tell us like, how we got to this place where there are people who say they just don't believe in God. Right. It's a hard title uh, because, and I'm saying this as someone who has assigned it, which sometimes I like that because it really makes me think about, well, how can I engage this particular topic in a way that I might not have chosen? And it gets me into a creative place. The hard thing about a title like that is that there isn't one atheism. I mean, there's a general sense we can define atheism as the belief that there are no gods or God, but at the end of the day, there's all kinds of atheists out there. There's practical atheists, there's scientific atheists, there's philosophical atheists, there's people who are atheists because they think it's cool, but they have no intellectual grounding for it. So there's, there's a lot of ways to look at this. There's atheists of the Enlightenment, there's the atheists of there's the new atheists, and, and then there's the atheists in academia, some of whom are very honest seekers of the truth. So it's a difficult title to grapple with, but I think what I'm trying to accomplish in this particular talk is really trying to look at the rise of atheism in, at different times in history and seeing what kind of lessons we can learn from it, uh, from all of those different um, scenarios. What can we learn and apply today as we evangelize people who don't believe in God? So, for example, I think that there's a lot to be learned from going back to the 18th century and seeing the rise of atheism in light of the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. There, atheism is seen as a, liber a way of liberating oneself, freeing themselves from the authority of, religious, of, the, of the church and of religious figures, and, and for good reason, because at, those time, at that time there was corruption and there was all kinds of problems with the way that the church was, was kind of handling itself and the, and the way that it operated in society. And so, uh, ironically, then you move into like later, you know, a couple hundred years later, and you've got the fall of the Berlin Wall. And, or even if you look at Soviet uh, or communist Poland, and people want religion as, because that's going to be the thing that liberates them. Um, and so that's an interesting, I think, uh, theme of atheism as liberator or atheism as oppressor. And so what I think is really important, though, is people became atheists going back to the French Revolution and, and, and that time because they were reacting to things going on really politically, but also, um, you know, again, with the church, but more politically than religiously. And so it was not so much on intellectual grounds so much as it was, was on more existential grounds. And so we have to remember that when we engage atheists, given what we've learned about why people drift towards atheism, it's not always going to be arguments that's going to move people in the direction that we like to see them move. It's going to be building relationships with them mm -hmm. and uh, maybe coming to show them that there's something attractive about the Christian option. Is this then where you're headed with this idea of the fall of atheism? I mean, is this an aspirational thing or is this, or is this actually something you, you see that atheism is like falling? Like it's not, it doesn't have as much traction as it once did. Yeah, so I kind of hinted at that when I talked about the fall of communism and how in, in countries like Poland, religion was actually seen as the liberator rather than the, the oppressor. Right. And so um, I think that we can also learn lessons from times in history when we saw the decline of atheism and what was it that people were looking for when they moved from non-religious worldviews to religious worldviews. Um, and there is something obviously liberating about Christianity. I mean, it's the ult it, properly understood, it's the ultimate way towards liberation or in Christian terms, salvation. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we really need to do, and this is, this, this is Blaise Pascal in the 17th century, but this is also something that a very intelligent atheist friend recently told me, and that is that to see the fall of atheism in our times, we have to make Christianity attractive. Mm -hmm. And so that's a theme that I, come to often throughout this talk is we need to make Christianity, Christianity attractive. Here are the lessons we've learned that tell us that, and then here are some ways that we can do that. I wonder if we could just tease out one or two of those ways. Like what, what, what kinds of things should we be thinking when we're engaging with atheists? Like 
as far as like putting our best foot forward for our faith, yeah. you know? Well, like I said, when people choose to adopt a worldview where they don't believe in God, it's not usually just for intellectual reasons. Right. And it's the same for when we choose to believe in God and become Catholic Christians. It's not necessarily just because of reasons. In fact, it's, you know, reasons might be the foundation for, for our trajectory in the Christian direction. But ultimately, there's something deeper going on when we, when we choose to become a Christian, which is a complete change in identity. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to atheism, I think we have to remember that people have existential and intellectual reasons, and so we have to do two things. To make Christianity attractive, number one, we have to show that it's reasonable, and this is the intellectual aspect. Mm -hmm. So we have to be able to make good arguments for our beliefs insofar as we can. We have to be clear communicators and be able to articulate our reasons well in a language that non-believers are going to understand. But on the existential side, the way we make Christianity attractive, I think, first and foremost, is to show that Jesus Christ makes a difference in our lives. Right. And so we live differently. Yeah. And not in a hoity-toity, nose-up-in-the-air way, like sending the message unwittingly or not that we're better than people who don't believe, but in a way that's genuinely humble, but also bold in the Pauline sense, where we know who our Savior is, we know our, we know our origin, we know our destiny, and we've been saved, and our lives show something that other people want. Yeah, I'm wondering if another way to put it might just be, don't act like an atheist ourselves, right? <laughs> act like we really have a God and that he means something to right. us and that he saved us, right? right? Well, what do you think going forward? What, are you optimistic or pessimistic? Or how do you feel about sort of the way things may be going with atheism in general or how, you know, how we can have these conversations or? So I was talking about this atheist friend of mine who rises up a couple times in the talk that I give who, like I said, an intelligent non-believer, but a seeker. And he has this really good comment that he made once. He said, the Catholic Church has withstood 2,000 years of adversity, whereas the new atheism could, couldn't even survive Jordan Peterson. Right. <laughs> and so uh, I think that we're headed in a good direction. And the reason why is because I think we saw that a sort of new atheist, sort of dishonest sort of atheism is not viable. Mm. Um, which is hopeful, what, but I also see signs in the culture that there is this gravitation towards a more intelligent, open-minded non-belief. You see that with people like some of these public figures like Dave Rubin, uh -huh. even Jordan Peterson, who's not, you know, as far as I can tell, a confessing Christian, mm -hmm. who I think has come to warm up towards Christianity as maybe even being true. Um, Tom Holland, a, a, a scholar, a historian who um, is willing to engage believers from an atheist perspective, but in a very friendly and open-minded way. Uh, and then serious philosophers like Graham Oppie today, who regularly engages in debate with some of the best Christian philosophers that um, the church has to offer. Mm -hmm. I think these are signs, and they've got followings. They've right. got their own disciples of people who want to do the same thing. So the fact that we're seeing dialogue open up and we're seeing this open-mindedness coming to the forefront on social media and other influential places, those are signs of hope, I think. Yeah, I wonder if it's almost like through people like this, it, it, we, we can see that atheism in the traditional sense is almost kind of like passe now, you know, that maybe it's uncool even. Well, maybe. I mean, the, the problem with books like The God Delusion and Christopher Hitchens' works and, and going, you know, going back to The New Atheist is like the new atheism has waned yeah. and they don't have near the influence that they once had. And even if you were going to write a book that's in the sort of tone of the new atheism making similar arguments, I don't think it would be a bestseller today. But, right. but you know, 10 years ago, that was a different story. Yeah. But there's a fallout from that era. You know, because yeah. they hit hard. That was a that was a influential movement when it was at its peak, and so they they uh, had an effect on the young people of uh, of our culture, and you still see that. But I think again, going back to what we can do, if we can effectively and clearly communicate the reasons for our belief, mm -hmm. and engage atheists where they're at, including those who are the sort of intellectual offspring of the Richard Dawkinses and the mm -hmm. Christopher Hitchens and so on. If we can be patient with them and open them up to, to a new kind of non-hostile towards atheism, Christianity, mm -hmm. make friends with these people, I think that we'll find that underneath all of that anger and superficial thinking about religion, I think we'll find that there's a, an honest and open seeker underneath that, that, that surface. Yeah, well, let's hope so. On that note, Matt, uh, thanks for taking the time to tell me about your work. Yeah. 
I thank all of you for joining us. And if you'd like to find out more about Matt's work, go to wordonfire.institute and also check out our YouTube channel and subscribe there. God bless. <laughs>